yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is uh, yeah. Uh, you, you correctly uh, uh, caught, caught me here. Yeah, this is true negatives, yeah. Not false negatives, yeah. So this is TN. I, I will correct it, yeah, later. Um, yeah, also, please, if, if, you, if you see any error or anything in, the, in uh, any of my notebooks, just tell me. And then I, I will try to correct them as soon as possible, yeah. It's uh, quite likely, yeah. Um, so which one should you use for your problem? Yeah, it depends, really. So let's, uh, let's uh, for the example that we, run, we ran, let's uh, make two uh, dummy classifiers. Yeah, yeah, no worries. So let's make two dummy classifiers. So the first classifier, I call it dummy model, basically tells that all the objects, what it does is that it, it predicts uh, all the objects to be in class zero. Yeah, it's quite simple, right? It, uh, it's like the example of the patients. It basically tells that none of the patients have this particular disease. And it gives, it, uh, yeah, it makes some prediction for any test example, and it makes some, uh, it predicts the probability for each, uh, for each uh, test example, right? And it basically, the, this probability object, uh, this, is like a, this is like an array, this is like a 2D array. Um, This is like a 2D array. The, the first column is the probability. So the first column is the probability of class uh, 0 conditioned on x. And the second column is the probability of class 1 conditioned on x, right? So if you see here, that it tells you that basically the probability that the objects yeah, the probability that all the objects uh, belong to class 0 is 1. And that means, by default, that the probability that the objects belong to class 1 is 0. Is that clear? So it's, a, it's a very simple model. It basically puts, uh, it basically assigns label 0 to all the examples in our problem. And then we make uh, another uh, model. I call it a random model. So the random model is also a dummy model. What it does is, it, is that it randomly assigns objects to either class 1 or class 0, right? So, it, so for any given objects, uh, it assigns them to either class 1 or class 0 with the same probability. So the predictions are randomly just assigned to either 1 or 2. I uh, set the random seats uh, to some fixed number, so you should all get the same answer as me, hopefully. And the predicted probability is basically 0.5. So, in this, uh, so this is like uh, for the rand for the for the dummy model, all of these are one, and all of these are zero. But for the random model, all of these are 0.5, and all of these are 0.5. Right? So there is an equal probability that all the objects belong to either class. So now let's look at the accuracy of the dummy model. The dummy model is the model that tells you that all the objects belong to class 0. And you see that the accuracy of the model is 99.4%, which is uh, ridiculously high, right? Uh, which also tells you that you shouldn't use accuracy as a measure of success for this particular problem, right? Because it, 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 yeah, it cannot detect anything. It cannot detect any object that belongs to the class, uh, the positive class, the class that we care about, right? So if you look at the confusion matrix of the class, uh, this dummy model, so it basically predicts that all the, all the objects are in class, uh, class 0. So the true positives are 0, and the false positives are also 0, because, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't give you, it doesn't assign the positive, positive label to any of the classes. So the, false pos the true positives and the false posi positives are all 0, and you have, yeah, you only have the true negatives and the false negatives. Yeah? 
Okay. So here we just want to uh, introduce another concept. It's called the rock curve. It's uh, uh, it's it stands for receiver operator characteristic or something like that. You can look up the history of the rock curve in uh, Wikipedia. Uh, I don't know. Once I heard the story that it has had to do with the uh, with the. I don't know, in the World War II, apparently, uh, they wanted to classify the objects that were traveling underneath the airplanes, like the fighters. And they wanted to, they wanted to like, classify whether these objects were like uh, enemy airplanes or like uh, birds, like flocks of birds and the stuff like that. Actually, I don't know how true that the story is, but yeah, okay, I guess you can go and check it yourself. And you can tell me if it's a, if a, if it's a true story. So in that, in that particular example, uh, so you have some classifiers. The classifiers are actually like uh, literally just human beings uh, saying that th this is a bird, this is an airplane, right? And then the positive in that example is airplane, and the negative is birds, right? Uh, if you had a dummy example, it would basically tell you that everything that flies underneath the airplane is a bird, right? It's a very good uh, classifier. Or if it's a very nasty uh, classifier, it would tell you that everything is an airplane, so you, 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 sh you have to shoot it, yeah? Or it can say that it's random, yeah? So you can tell the, yeah, you can, you can go and uh, look at the story. But then the, the, this, yeah, rock stands for receiver operating uh, char characteristics. So then the problem is that when you run a machine learning algorithm, it doesn't just uh, provide you with a label, it provides you with a probability. Um, so let's say you introduce a, a new example to the machine learning algorithm X, right? So the algorithm, let's say you give this to a logistic regression or neural networks or a decision tree or whatever, whatnot or the k-nearest neighbors, uh, the things that we've already discussed, right? The, so it basically gives you two probability. The probability that this object belongs to class, let's say you have two classes also. The probability that obj this object belongs to class uh, one, so p of c one conditioned on x, and the probability that this object belongs to class two, conditioned on x. So this is basically actually just one minus one minus uh, p of c one condition on x, right? Because because of the basic rule of probability, these two, the sum of the two should uh, should be one, right? So so the algorithm doesn't doesn't tell you which which object uh, which class your object belongs to, right? The algorithm tells you these two probabilities, right? So. So how do you so so now my question is for you how do you say the object belongs to how do you assign a class to the objects based on these two probabilities actually based on one of them this is just one minus this so let's say the algorithm tells you that the the probability of class 1 conditioned on x is like uh, some number um, how do you assign a label a class to this uh, object to this example Yeah. Yeah, that's that's correct. Yeah, but uh, yeah, something even simpler than that. Threshold. Sorry. Threshold. A threshold. Yeah. So you you just pick one number, and yeah, and then the you pick that number in order to eventually yeah, optimize those uh, things like the completeness and the recall and stuff like that. So you but you have to pick one number, right? Yeah. So we pick one number. We say. If this probability is larger than 0.5, the object belongs to uh, class one, and if it's uh, and if this uh, uh, num uh, if uh, this probability is less than 0.5, the object belongs to class two, class zero. Uh, let's make this zero because we are working with zero and one here. Yeah, is that clear? 
But this number is like arbitrary. I can either pick 0.5, I can pick 0.8, I can pick whatever. I can pick, I can pick 0.9 uh, even, right? So depending on, depending on what, uh, what uh, number you pick, so I'm going to call this a threshold. If p of c1 conditioned on x is larger than a threshold, we say the object belongs to class uh, 1 and 0 otherwise, right? So the way we pick this threshold is to optimize the true positive rate so, so, so depending, on the, depending on the problem we want to solve, we either want to optimize the accuracy or the true positive rate, or, the, or we want to minimize the false positive rates, right? So we want to minimize the contamination, but at the same time, we want to optimize the completeness. So, so depending on the problem you want to solve, uh, you have to pick a threshold, right? that optimizes, that maximizes the true positive rate and minimizes the false positive rate. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to maximize the completeness, which is the false positive rate. But at the same time, you want to minimize the false positive rate. But that really depends on the problem. So sometimes you, you, just, you may just want to maximize the true positive rate. You may, uh, depending on the problem, you might actually just want to maximize the accuracy, right? So, so it's, it really depends on your problem, the, the problem that you want to solve. So for instance, if you want to detect quasars out of the stars, um, what you want to optimize, you want to maximize the completeness, you want, as many you want to detect as many quasars as possible, but at the same time, you want to minimize the number of the stars that sneak into your sample, right? Because you don't want the stars. So you have to pick this uh, threshold somehow. So, let's, so that's the idea behind the rock curve, the receiver operating characteristic. And we have three minutes. Let's see if we can go over this in three minutes. So, oops, I gave up the punchline. Uh, so you can, yeah, so here in this cell, you can compute the probabilities from the logistic regression model, right? And then given the probabilities, uh, so the y positive prop is basically the probability that these objects, the test examples, belong to the class 1, the class that you care about, right? And then basically you can uh, call this uh, function rock curve, and it gives you the thresholds. So it's basically these numbers plus the false positive rates and the and the true positive rates, right? So basically this function gives you the thresholds that we talk about, these thresholds, and also the true positive rates that uh, correspond to these thresholds and the false posi positive rates that belong to these thresholds, right? So if I increase the threshold, what's going to happen to the true positive rates? Can, can someone say? Yeah, the false positives are going to, no, if I increase the thresholds. No, so if I, if, I, if I set the threshold to zero, for instance, right, uh, everything is going to be positive, right? So the true positive rate is going to be actually maximum because everything is going to be in the positive class. But if I, uh, if I, set the, if I uh, in, increase the threshold, what's going to happen to the false positive rate. It's going to be minimized, right? But then, but then if you increase the threshold, the true positive rate is going to become a small, right? So you want to pick a threshold that uh, maximizes the true positive rate and minimizes the false positive rate. Yeah. So if you run this, um, so forget about this for now. So in this plot, you see the, yeah, the true positive rate as a function of thresholds. So if you set the threshold to 0, the true positive rate is going to be 1. It means that you're going to pick up all the objects. You're going to say all the objects belong to class 1. So obviously, the true positive rate is going to be maximum. 
But then if you increase the threshold to 1, let's say you only allow objects to be in class 1 if the, if the probability is more than 1, which is impossible because probability is bounded by 1. So you're not going to pick up any object right, as, as, uh, as class 1. So the true positive rate is going to be 0. And as for the false positive rate, if you set it to 0, if you set the threshold to 0, the false positive rate is going to be 1. Do you know why? Oh, really? Ah. No, actually, it's, uh, it was here. Is it good now? Or maybe it's actually turned off. Yeah, I don't know. So yeah, if you yeah, if you change the um, is it the false positive rate? Let me see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you, yeah, if you put the threshold to zero, uh, it is, is the false positive rate is also going to be maximum, right? Because uh, all the all the objects that are negative are going to also be in the positive class. So your sample is going to be highly contaminated. So if you p if you set the threshold to zero, uh, you're going to pick up all the quasars, but also at the same time all the stars are going to also be in your sample. So your your sample is going to be highly contaminated, right? And if you increase the threshold, uh, the false positive rate is going to become a small, which means that uh, you're going to have a very strict criteria for having uh, uh, objects in your quasar or in your positive or in your having a disease sample, right? But at the same time, you're going to have very few positive examples. Right? So if you, if you set this threshold to 0.9, it means that this probability has to be more than 0.9 in order for the objects to be in your positive class, in your quasar class, right? So it's going to be very difficult for, uh, for your model to achieve this. So you're, gonna, you're not going to have any, you're not going to have th that many positive examples. So you have to pick a threshold that minimizes this, but also at the same time, doesn't really uh, decreases this uh, true positive rate that much, right? So for instance, if I pick the threshold to be 0.1, uh, I'm going to have like a 1% uh, contamination. That means that 1% of the objects that I have detected are going to be just stars. But then at the same time, a large fraction of them also are going to be still in the positive class. Like, uh, like, like 99, I'm going to pick up like 99% of the quasars or something like that, or 90%. Yeah? So yeah, so what happens if you do this calculation for the, for the, the, for the dummy model, the model that tells you everything is a, a star? or no one has that disease, right? Or the random model, that the, the model that randomly assigns all the objects to their either classes, right? With the equal probability. So if you do this, what you see that the, the, false, the true positive rate as a function of false positive rate is going to be um, it's, it's just going to be like uh, the, the true positive rate and the false positive rate are going to be equal to each other for the, for the random model and the dummy model. Do you know why is that? Can you say? Can you tell why, why, the, why you get something like this? If you have a random model? Yeah. The, yeah. In the dummy model also because the false positive rate, the, false, the number of false positives and the true positives are, all, are always going to be zero. So they're always going to be equal to each other. That's why. Yeah. So this is the rock. So this is what I call the rock curve. This is the true positive rate and the false positive rate, right? And this is the worst possible uh, performance. So if you have an algorithm that uh, ha gives you a curve below this, there's us there must be a bug somewhere in your code because it's not possible to go below this. This is like the worst possible thing ever. <laughs>
And the, the further you are, the, the closer you are to this edge, the better the algorithm is, essentially. Uh, yeah. And if your algorithm is just totally, utterly nonsense or random, you're just going to get, get this the diagonal term. So I think this is it. No, actually, what time is it now? 11. Oh, we have one more hour. Yeah. <laughs> I got excited. I was like, yeah, we're, we're done. So that was fast, actually. Um, so yeah, so now, now we can actually, uh, so now we're done with day one, I think. Um, so before, before closing this, just uh, do this place. Click on uh, uh, restart all run, run times. Don't, don't click on this, the restart and run all. If you click on this, it's just going to restart and run everything again. You don't want that. Just restart uh, all run times. So it can free the resources. Yes, it's OK. Yes. Hold it. So as I said, in day one, we covered all of the materials in day one. There is this example, Quasar Photo Z estimation. Um, we're not going to go through it. If you have any question, you can come to the office either before afternoon or after the class in the afternoon. And I can walk you through it. But then, yeah, and you can look at it uh, yourself. You can play around with it. Um, so if you go to day two, so, which is today, uh, we're, we're going to talk about uh, neural networks. Um, I've also created some uh, slides um, because uh, some of the concepts are hard to describe in IPython notebooks, in a Jupyter notebook. Uh, I haven't put the slides on the GitHub repository yet. Um, this is actually empty. The, I'm going to delete this. Um, so, so yeah, I'm uh, after this class, I'm going to put the slides on the GitHub repository. So today we're going to talk about just uh, yeah, basic, like fully connected neural networks. And then tomorrow we're going to talk about convolutional neural networks. But then first we're going to start with uh, neural nets underscore 101. This is a Jupyter notebook, but there's, no, there's not much code in it. There's just a bit of math. Um, I think in order to understand, uh, get, have some understanding of the neural networks, uh, you just need to understand the math. The math is actually quite simple. It's basically just linear algebra. Um, so I don't know, have you taken any linear algebra course? I'm curious. Yeah, yeah, you should all be, yeah, it should be okay. So as long as you know basic uh, calculus and the linear algebra, you should uh, be able to understand how neural networks, how neural networks uh, work. Because basically neural networks are basically just a combination of some nonlinear operations and some linear algebra. It's, it's nothing beyond that. And some smart uh, tricks for optimizing and coming up with architectures and stuff like that. And also some probability theory. So if you go down the page, uh, I have some uh, resources that you can go and look at. Um, so yeah, these are some references that you can go and look at. There is a deep learning book by uh, Jan Goodfellow. Uh, this is a PDF, and it's available online. You can go and. Uh, it's actually a very thick book. I don't recommend you to go and actually open it and read it, the, the whole thing, because it's going to take ages. Uh, and there is this, this book, this machine learning and pattern recognition. This is also, these two are very formal books. But if you want to really understand the math, it's actually quite nice. Uh, but there are some uh, video lectures associated with this book. So this uh, Jan Goodfellow. Uh, guy is a very prominent uh, deep learning researcher. 
uh, he basically walks through the, uh, the book in this video lecture. Uh, if you also want to understand deep learning also, yeah, how it works from the ground up, I also suggest you to go and look at these uh, YouTube videos by Andrew Eng. This is actually quite nice. Uh, it, this is a Coursera book, but then all the YouTube videos, all the lectures are on YouTube for free. You can go out actually. And this is actually quite nice. There is this uh, YouTube channel. It's got three blue, one brown. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah, it's really cool actually. It's, uh, it, uh, uh, the, there's this guy who makes animations and explains math. And there's a very nice explanation of how neural networks uh, work here. And there's also TensorFlow tutorials. If you go on YouTube also and also on the website itself, they have a lot of TensorFlow tutorials. And I think they also have a lot of tutorials in Spanish as well. If you go on YouTube for TensorFlow, they have a lot of uh, tutorials. I mean, yeah, you may want to either choose Spanish or English, whatever you want, or Japanese. I don't know, who, whatever, what, whatever language you want. Uh, but yeah, they have a lot of uh, tutorials in different languages on YouTube. So this is actually quite nice. And there's a book that is uh, called uh, Math for uh, AI. It's basically the mathematics for artificial intelligence. It's a walkthrough of the mathematics behind the machine learning algorithms. Uh, just, just like I said, uh, yeah, all you need to know is a bit, of a bit of probability, a bit of linear algebra. That's it. There's not much else. And yeah, some calculus as well. You, need, you always need calculus. Um, Let's go up the, yeah, oops, what did I do? Yeah, you don't have to run this, you, ha you don't have to open this in Colab because it's basically all math. Uh, it might be a bit boring, but I promise I'll uh, try to finish it soon. But it's important to uh, understand this, uh, this uh, tiny bit of math before going to, uh, before discussing deep learning. Uh, yeah, if it's boring, apologies. But then, yeah, we're, we're going to do it more exciting things later in the afternoon. So let's say you have a, you have a problem. You, you have two, uh, so yeah, you have, a, you have an example X, and you want to know whether it belongs to class one or class zero, right? So that's the ultimate goal. Is this a small? Can you read this, or should I? Uh, it's very, it's, it's extremely small, right? Yeah. I want to zoom in a bit. Is it better now? I'm going to zoom in even more. Yeah. Now it should be quite good. Okay. So you have an object. The ultimate goal is to, to estimate this probability, right? You want to find the probability of class 1 conditioned on x, right? So, this pro so have you heard of the Bayes uh, theorem? It's basically just a, uh, yeah, it's, it's not even, this is not even Bayes theorem, actually. This is basically, this is some basic conditional probability. So p of c1 condition on x times this. This is the object that we want to estimate, we want to find. This is the goal of machine learning, or well, supervised learning. And so, and this is the prior probability. This is basically the probability of class one and the probability of having uh, this observation conditioned on class one, right? So you can write this p of x as the sum of these probabilities, right? It's quite simple, right? So p of x is, uh, you can write it down, you can break it down into C1 and C2, like this, right? This is also just basic probability. Um, and the summation is over all the classes. So you have two classes, zero and one. Then, we can combine these two. If you combine these two, if you combine these two, the, prob the probability of class one conditioned on x, so this is what we care about, right? This is what we want to estimate with uh, machine learning and deep learning. 
This is basically this object, right? And then if you divide the denominator by the numerator, you get this one, one plus uh, this object, right? And now I can define some uh, uh, activation function. So now I can define something new. Let's say, so this is the one I want to estimate with deep learning or any machine learning algorithm. And now, so this has this functional form. It's like one divided by one plus something else, right? Now I say this one plus divided by one plus something else, I'm going to call it a, a sigmoid function. It's a sigmoid activation function, right? This is, I'm going to say, I have a variable called z, right? For now, don't get too bogged down by the variable. It's just some uh, auxiliary variable. And then I'm going to call this expression exponential of uh, mi uh, yeah, minus z, right? And I'm going to call this whole thing a sigmoid a activation function, right? So the probability of C1 conditioned on x, this is a sigmoid, this is a sigmoid function. So this is the first important p bit that you need to remember in deep learning, right? So this is a sigmoid function. And the probability that the x is not in class 0 is basically just 1 minus uh, sigma z, right? So now the, now the goal is to estimate this sigmoid function, essentially. So what is the sigmoid function? Yeah, if you go and implement it in uh, Python, uh, it's just this, right? 1 plus whatever. And now if you plot it, it's going to look like this. So the sigmoid function, activation function, uh, is bounded between 0 and 1. What, why is it important for the sigmoid act activation function to be bounded between 0 and 1? Can someone say? Tell? Yeah, it's a probability and it has to be normalized and it has to be bounded between 0 and 1. Yeah. So when x is large, is, uh, so when, when z is large, the probability is 1 which means that the object belongs to class 1. And if x, if z is less than uh, 0, then the object is most likely in class, uh, class 0, right? So now let's go back to the probabilities. So yeah, so the probability that uh, object x is in class 1 is sigma, the, sig the sigmoid function. And the probability that the object is in the other class is like 1 minus the sigmoid function, right? Now, let's look at the variable a, or actually, it was z, and now it's a. I'll, I'll change it in the, uh, later, yeah. Uh, yeah, so a is like the, basically the logarithm of uh, this object, right? This is like some uh, variable that we defined ourselves, right? So you can break it down like a... Uh, You've seen this, right? You can uh, break down the logarithm like this. Uh, so you have something that is a function of x, and you have something that is a function of, uh, that does not depend on x, is a constant, right? And now I can say that I can approximate this object as a linear transformation. I can say this is basically some w times x. And this is some constant, so I'm going to call it a b, right? Then basically what you have is a, where x is like have some dimensions, right? So x is a d-dimensional object, right? So what you have is that, so you have, let's say x is a d-dimensional object. You have x1 and xd. They all come to... So this is basically just one example, right? So you have one example, and its dimension is d. So let's say this is, um, these are the magnitudes of uh, an object in your galaxy survey, right? So this is, so you have a galaxy survey, uh, you look at some object, this is like a whatever, and this is your galaxy survey, this is a telescope, doesn't look like a telescope, but whatever. 
and it gives you uh, uh, five numbers, U, G, R, I, Z, right? So these can be these five numbers, U, G, R, I, Z. This is just one object, right? And they go to here. So here, what happens is that the X1 to XD, they get mul multiplied by some, by some uh, function, by some uh, matrix. So you have W1, X1 plus W, D, X, D, right? Plus some constant, right? So basically what happens here is that uh, I'm going to call this a neuron, right? So this is a neuron. And what happens inside the neuron is that the, the features, the features that, you know, for instance, they can be the magnitudes of the objects in the galaxy survey. They come into this neuron. They get, they get multiplied by a function. And they get uh, um, uh, added by some constant. So what happens here is basically just W i x i plus B sigma i, right? And then how do I get a probability out of this? I apply a nonlinear activation function to it. So this, I apply a nonlinear activation function to this, and this becomes a probability. So this is the most basic neural networks you could ever imagine, I guess. Yeah, so this is actually, yeah, this is the simplest version of a neural network. So you have a bunch of features. They go here. They get added. This is just linear algebra. And then inside the neuron, and then you, add, you basically apply a nonlinear activation function to these numbers. And this gives you the probability of this object belonging to the class one, C1 is by x, essentially. So that's, 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 yeah, that's all you have. Quite simple. And now the dob so w and b are some free parameters that we need to estimate, right? So here note that I say this is w transpose x plus b. Depending on where you look at, this might be wx plus b. It doesn't matter much. But then, let's say x is a d-dimensional like object, right? What is the what is the dim dimension of this matrix? So uh, x is a x is a vector like this x one xd, right? And then w transpose x is a scalar. What is the dimension of w? Can someone tell? Yeah, it's like a 1 times d, yeah. So w is a 1 times d dimensional uh, matrix, essentially. Right? So this is the dimension of the matrix. So it's always important to keep track of the dimensions of the matrices because uh, in, the, in the future, I mean, I guess in half an hour, we're going to look at even more complicated things. So yeah, it's always important to do this. So yeah, logistic regression, the model that we used in the previous uh, Jupyter notebook, basically does this. It's very simple. It's a very simple neural network. It's like a, so you have, uh, you have uh, one example with a set of features. It goes into a neuron, it gets multiplied by uh, a bunch of numbers, and it gets added by another number, and then you have this uh, non, uh, activation function, sigma, which is applied to these numbers, right? And then... Does, it, does this actually work? <laughs> I don't think so. It's okay. I'll try to speak loudly. Uh, I, it's working. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, I, I'll, then I'll, I want to speak loudly. Um, yeah, so, and then you have W and B. So these are the free parameters of the model. And we're gonna talk about how to optimize them. So don't worry about them. And so what is the cost function for this problem? This is what we call a cross-entropy cost function. 
So don't get uh, scared by the name. It's actually quite uh, yeah. It's it's not it's not a very it's not a very scary uh, thing. Uh, so let's say you have a bunch of data sets, training data sets. You have x n and y n. Uh, I promise I'll go through the math quickly so we can do more exciting things uh, soon. Uh, so you have a bunch of examples and a bunch of labels, right? The labels are either zero or one. Right? And then, as we said, you can compute the probabilities y hat as this. Right? So the probability that the example xn belongs to the class C1 is this uh, y hat. And it's basically a sigmoid function applied to this uh, uh, linear operation. Right? So what is the probability of observing the label, the true label yn? So this is the observed label yn uh, given these three parameters, w and b. So you can write this as this. So the probability of the observing the true label condition on the three parameters of the model is basically the multiplication of these two probabilities, right? And then you can write it as this. Uh, you can write it as uh, this times 1 minus this. And since, y, uh, since yn, the observed uh, label, is either 1 or 0, you can write this as this. Because like p of c1 condition on x is y hat. y hat is what comes out of the neural network, right? And it's a probability. And then the, the probability of uh, observing all the labels, these are the, obser the uh, combination of all the observed labels of the examples, conditioned on the three parameters of the model, is basically just this multiplication, right? Because these are independent variables, so the probability of uh, you know, a bunch of, uh, a combination of independent variables conditioned on a set of parameters is basically the multiplication of the, pro the individual probabilities, right? So you can factor it out. And then you can define a cost function. So how do we define a cost function? The cost function uh, is something that we, we want to minimize in order to uh, obtain the free parameters of the model. So minimizing the cost function is equivalent to maximizing the probability of observing the true labels, right? So you can define the cost function as the mi minus uh, uh, one times the logarithm of the, this probability, right? Is that clear? So minimizing this is equivalent to maximizing this probability. So that's how the cost function is defined. So if you take the minus log of this, you get this, uh, this expression. And this is what we call a cross-entropy cost function. So for any neural network algorithm that, uh, that deals with classification, a binary cl uh, classification, uh, we, we define this uh, cost function. So it doesn't matter how deep your neural network is. In the end, two numbers, in the end, one number is going to come out of it per example, right? So here I have a one, this is a one layer neural network. Let's say, let's say I have a deeper neural network. Let's say I have a neural network that has a bunch of uh, layers. I'm going to talk about this, don't worry. And then you have a bunch of other layers and they're all connected. And then you have this sigmoid uh, output layer. So I'm going to call this the output layer, right? xn1, xn d. So this is one example, right? So these are these go inside this. So xn is just one example in the data, right? Uh, so this index basically tells you uh, this is like uh, this te tells you that this is like one of the examples in the data. Let's say you have capital N examples, and x uh, uh, n is like one of them, right? And then xn itself has uh, the dimension d. So xn gets multiplied by a bunch of, uh, by a bunch of um, uh, matrices. And then uh, some 
plus some uh, nonlinear activation function. And then this gets uh, multiplied by another matrix plus another activation function. And then in the end, what you have for a binary classification example, in the end, what you get is like one number. It's like y n hat. And this is the probability that the object is in class 1. Is that clear? Oh yeah, then that would be no. Usually, in in real world examples, there is not there is no correlation between the probability that the object is a star is is independent of the probability that object that object is a is a quasar, for instance. Yeah, so okay, you, you can always do this. Yeah, then you have to find uh, another way of labeling your objects, yeah. Okay, and another question is, I don't understand very well where does the two digits of n comes from. Wh which one? Uh, in the, the after, so what is the probability of observing, yep. The Why has n? Hat two digits of n in the in a up. Where? We have g sub hat n, sub n, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hat yeah. Below, below. Uh, this. So yeah, yeah. So th this only works out because y n is uh, y n is either one or zero. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it if y n wasn't y uh, zero or one, this wouldn't work out. Yeah, but, uh, but I don't understand if where does it come from because from the upside formula mm -hmm. we replace that there. Uh, I don't see where does it the g of n come from. No, no. Why uh, you mean y n? So why? Yeah. Y yeah. N. No, yn is the true label, yeah, is, yeah. is the observed label, and it's either 0 or 1. Yeah, I get it, but, but we have the probability of class 1 given the xn. Yeah? Yes, and yes. A g hat sub n. Yes. Not g hat sub n to the g sub n. That's what I don't understand. Ah, oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. You can, yeah, th this, is, this is because yn is either 0 or 1, so you can always write this. If yn wasn't either 0 or 1, you wouldn't have been able to write this down. Yeah, yeah. This, is the, yeah this is only, you can, you can only do this because yn is either 0 or 1. If yn wasn't either 0 or 1, uh, you wouldn't have been able to do this. Uh, we can talk about it after the class, yeah. So yeah. So anyways. So whenever you, have a, whenever you have a binary classification, you have this cost function, right? So this is the uh, cross entropy cost function. So what if you have more than one class? So here we talked about just the two classes. So what if you have more than two classes? Uh, basically, you can write down this probability, conditional probability function like this, right? And then, if you define this object as this exponential of a, then the, pro the probability of observing class i condition on x is this, uh, is this object, right? And this is what we call a softmax, uh, softmax activation function. So let's say you have, and this has the, this has the uh, property that the sum over all the classes is going to be 1. So whenever you have a binary classification, you have a, sigmo uh, you have a sigmoid ac uh, activation function. And whenever you have multiple classes as the output, you have the softmax, right? And we'll talk about it uh, uh, later. Uh, so you don't have to, uh, we'll come back to the, so yeah, I'll also say it, I guess, yeah. Uh, so yeah, basically, so you have this ob uh, you have this operation. So this is the building block of essentially neural networks, right? Uh, so you have a nonlinear activation function, and you have some uh, uh, linear operation, right? So that's all you need to know for uh, that happens in a neural network. And as for the activation function, sometimes. 
uh, instead of the sigmoid activation, activation function, we use a different activation function. We use uh, uh, something different. So we can either use a tanch activation function or relu. Relu is a rectified uh, linear, yeah, or Ricky le le relu, right? And if you visualize them in uh, Python, they're going to look like so. This is tanch. Tanch is actually very similar to. Uh, Tanch is very similar to um, sigmoid, but also note that Tanch is not between uh, is not bounded between minus one and one, so you cannot use Tanch for the output limit uh, so for the output layer, because the output layer has to be a probability, and the probabilities are bounded between zero and one by construction, so you cannot use Tanch or Relu in the output layers. So for the output layer. If you have two classes, you use a sigmoid activation function. If you have multiple classes, you use softmax. Uh, we didn't talk about softmax that much, but don't, yeah, don't worry about it. It doesn't matter much. But then for the, for the other linear, for the other uh, hidden layers of the neural networks, we use either relu or tanch. Actually, we don't even use tanch. It's always better to use relu or the leaky version of it, right? But for the outputs, for the output, for the end of the neural networks, you should always use a you should always use a sigmoid activation function. Uh, so yeah, this is all from this uh, notebook. Uh, I'm going to quickly go through some uh, slides. I'm going to put it on internet uh, on the GitHub repository soon. Still loading. Yeah, so let's go through some uh, int yeah introduction to neural networks. Uh, there's there's not going to be that much math, but uh, yeah less probability. But there's going to be uh, still some math. But uh, if you just go through the math as, uh, a little bit, then you, you build up some understanding of how neural networks work, and then. Uh, it, it helps you gain intuition about, uh, uh, yeah. So the underlying math of neural networks is not that complicated. As I said, it's just linear algebra and some like uh, calculus. So if, uh, yeah, it's good to be patient, uh, just a little bit patient to go through, walk through the math. And then once you know the math, you can uh, start writing a code and, you know, do more exciting things. So let's uh, start with the problem. Let's say I have a survey, I have a telescope, right? I look at the objects uh, and I compute the, uh, measure the magnitudes of these objects in five different bands, like U, G, R, I, Z. And I want to tell whether this object is a star or a quasar. So we're going to go back to this example, and we're going to solve it with, the, with deep learning later in the afternoon. But before that, we have to go through the, a, bit of, a slight bit of math. So you have, a, you have some observations. You have some features, U, G, R, I, Z. And you want to know whether this object is a star or a quasar. So this is what we talked about. So a vanilla, a, a simplest form of a neural network that you can imagine is a one, one layer neural network. You have a set of features, right? And these features go into this uh, output layer. And in the output layer, you have this uh, simple operation. So you multiply the features with uh, some matrices, right? And you add some scalar to it, and then you apply some nonlinear activation function to them. And you get the probability that this object is a quasar. So this is basically just a probability. So the features go in. They get multiplied by uh, some matrix. They get added by some scalar. After some nonlinear activation units, you get a probability that this object is a quasar or a star. So this is the sigmoid function. It's bounded between 0 and 1 because it's a probability. It has to be bounded between 0 and 1. 
But let's see if we can go deeper. Let's say if, uh, how we can uh, make this neural network a bit deeper. Because if you, go, uh, if you go deeper, then you can, and if you have a lot of data, and if you go deeper, then you can learn more about the underlying structure of the data. Um, so in the previous example that we walked through, you had the input layer. So these are the features. So in the example of the objects in the galaxy survey, these are basically U, G, R, I, Z, right? So these are like five numbers that you measure with the telescope. These are five magnitudes. And the output is a probability of this object being a quasar or not being a quasar, right? So in the previous example, you only had the input layer and the output layer. But what if you add like more layers, more hidden layers? So, le so now you have three hidden layers. You have the first hidden layer, the second one, and the third one. The third one is just the output layer. It basically, uh, there's another matrix op operation here, uh, plus some nonlinear activation, and then you get the probability. So at every hidden layer, what you have is basically some matrix, uh, some, uh, some matrix, uh, some linear operation plus uh, nonlinear activation units, right? So your features go to this hidden layer. They get multiplied by a matrix, right? They get added by a scalar, and then they are applied a nonlinear activation function. Then these are your new features. You can, you can think of them as, in, as new features. Then these go to another layer. They get multiplied by another matrix. They get added by a scalar. And they are applied in a linear, another nonlinear activation unit. And then these, so these become your new features. So these get multiplied by a matrix. And then they're added by a scalar. And they're applied in a linear activation unit. And they become this. And this is your output, right? So what are the dimensions of the matrices that are here, here, and here? So let's say you have m inputs, right? These m inputs go to another hidden, go to a hidden layer where, where you have three hidden units, right? So you have an m-dimensional vector, and then they become three-dimensional. And this three-dimensional vector becomes five-dimensional. And this five-dimensional vector becomes one-dimensional. So what matrix operation do you need to make this m-dimensional vector a three-dimensional vector? Yeah, three times m, yeah. So, well, it's a, a remember by, by construction, we have w transpose x. Uh, you're familiar with the transpose, right? So when you have transpose, you just switch the columns and the rows, right? So it has to be, the linear operation has to be three, three times m. So the matrix is, uh, itself is m times three. So here you have an m times three uh, matrix plus a vector, a one, one times three uh, vector. And this is just a constant. So this is the matrix that you multiply. And this is the constant you add to make it a three-dimensional block, right? And then what matrix operation do you need to make this three-dimensional feature a five-dimensional feature? Can someone volunteer? So you want, you want a matrix that makes this three-dimensional vector a five-dimensional vector. Yeah, three times five, yeah. Three times five because there is a transpo transpose here. Actually, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's a five by three, but then if you transpose it, it's a three by five, right? So this is a three by five. So you have a three by five matrix plus a one by five. This is just a constant, right? You can also think of this as a, as a weight, but yeah, for now, this is just a constant. So in the second, so this two basically means that this is the second hidden layer. 
Oh, yeah, sorry, I didn't notice, uh, explain the notation here. So that's um, a superscript parenthesis one that is basically it tells you that uh, these matrices, these parameters are the, for the first hidden layer. And this is for the, these matrices are for the second hidden layer. So what do you need in order to make this five dimensional thing a one dimensional thing? Yeah, one by five. Well, it's a transpose, yeah. So uh, it's a transpose, so it's a five by one. Right, so you have a five by one plus one constant. And the three, the superscript three means that these are the matrices uh, that belong to the hidden layer, uh, the third hidden layer, which is also the last and the output hidden layer, right? So that, that's all that happens in a, so we call this a fully connected neural network. Uh, or if in some, in some, I guess, textbooks, they call them feed forward, something like that, or even artificial neural network. But yeah, but this is a fully connected neural networks. Um, so that's all that happens inside the neural, in a fully connected neural network. So you have these uh, matrix operations, and in each, uh, in each uh, hidden layer, you also have a uh, nonlinear activation unit, right? Which is either a ReLU or a sigmoid. So here we have a ReLU. You can also use a sigmoid, but it's better to use a ReLU here. You have a ReLU activation function. Remember, the ReLU activation function was just like this. So you have, if, if, if z is larger than 0, it's, uh, it's z. If z is uh, smaller than 0, it's 0. This is a ReLU activation function. So this, what th so this is what happens in a, in a three-layer neural network. So you have some matrix operation here, plus some ReLU activation function. Another matrix operation here, plus a ReLU activation function. And another matrix uh, operation here, plus a sigmoid, uh, sigmoid because you want uh, to get probabilities in the end, right? So this is what happens. So if you have like L layers, at each layer you have a bunch of uh, matrix operations. So these are basically just matrices. And these are the free parameters of the model. Right? So these are the parameters that you want to estimate. And then what happens is that, so you have some input, gets multiplied plus a nonlinear, you get Z1. Z1 gets multiplied by this plus in a linear unit becomes Z2, and so on and so on, right? But then if you, look at the, if you look at this operation, you can write down the function like this. So you have, so each, each layer has its own output. You can think of uh, Z1s as the outputs of each layer, right? And the final output of the, uh, of the neural network, these are the probabilities, these are basically this can be obtained by uh, uh, recursively applying these functions to one another, right? So you can think of this as a function. This is a function of x. But z2 itself is a function of z1. zl is the output of the elf uh, hidden unit, uh, hidden layer. And this is a function of zl minus 1, and so on. And then in the end, you get, like, you get a cost function. This is like your cross entropy cost function, the one we talked about already, right? So y hat is the probability, and y is a true label. So uh, y is like either 0 or 1, and your y hats are the probabilities that are between 0 and 1. These, are, these come from the sigmoid uh, act, uh, activation function. So how do we find these uh, parameters? So these are the three parameters of the model. How do we find them? So the answer is actually surprisingly simple. So let's look at this again. Um, so you have some cost function that you need to minimize. And you have a bunch of free parameters, right? Uh, so how do you optimize this cost function uh, with respect to the free parameters? You, so you have to take the derivatives of the, the partial derivatives of the cost function with respect to the free parameters. 
So how does it work? So the answer is quite simple. All you need is the chain rule. So I guess you uh, you've uh, uh, studied chain rule already, right? In calculus. Yeah. Okay. Good. So uh, yeah, I guess in the first year of university, I guess, or even the second year, or whatever, or even in high school, uh, you you read about uh, you studied chain rules. Yeah. So basically, if you want to take the so theta L, theta L is like you can think of theta L as a combination of uh, W, L, and B, L. So this is like a one parameter that belongs to the layer L. And we want to compute the derivative of J, the cost function, with respect to theta L, which is the combination of the matrix and this uh, constant vector. So this is basically quite, yeah, this is quite simple. You take the derivative of j with respect to zl. This is easy to compute because it's just a sigmoid function. Times uh, the derivative of zl uh, with respect to l minus 1, right? And this is just a matrix operation, right? Um, so if you go... If you go deeper inside the neural network, let's say you want to compute the derivative of j with respect to wl minus 1 and bl minus 1. So what do you do? Then you use the chain rule even uh, further, right? So the, the partial derivative of the cost function with respect to the parameters of the l minus 2 layer can be obtained by uh, by taking the derivative of the cost function with respect to the parameters of the first layer times the, uh, times the, uh, the partial derivative of the parameters of the L minus 1 layer with respect to the parameters of the L minus 2 layers, right? So using this simple chain rule, you can just go all the way back in the neural network, right? It's, a, like a, it's basically just a chain rule, right? And uh, we all know how to compute uh, derivatives. And we all know how to compute uh, multiply matrices. So using this simple chain rule, you can go all the way back to lay, uh, the elf layer of the neural network and compute the partial derivative of the cost function with respect to the parameters of the elf layer of the neural network. And this is something that, uh, if you read the neural network textbooks, this is something that's called the back propagation, so, or uh, back prop. So this is a back prop. So now we know the gradients. How do we optimize the parameters? How do we find the parameters of the neural network? So we use an algorithm called the gradient descent. So the gradient descent is actually quite simple. Let's say you start with some parameters, some uh, randomly initialized parameters for the thetas. Um, and you know these parameters, so this is like the, let's say you are initially, you, are, you pick some random variables for the parameters. How do you update them in order to minimize the cost function? So the answer is, the, the, uh, the answer is in the gradient descent algorithm. So let's say you have a function. So let's say you have a function. This is j. This is theta. And you want to estimate this. This, this is the theta the star that gives you the minimum of the cost function, right? This is j of theta. And you start somewhere from here, right? So the gradient descent algorithm tells you that at any given time, let's say now you're here in the parameter space, right, at time t. The gradient descent algorithm basically tells you that, tells you to computes the derivative of the cost function with respect to this parameter at this point. This is theta t. And then the update the parameter according to this rule. So you compute the derivative. You multiply it by some 
constant, we call this the learning rate. And then we subtract the, the current parameter with this uh, learning rate times the partial derivative. And that gives you the new position of the parameter. So this move, uh, this, let's, let's think of this as a ball that is rolling down a hill, right? Basically, this rule gives you that the ball, the, uh, the ball has to go through, has to move towards the direction of the maximal descent, right? So this rule basically tells you that the ball has to move like this. So in the next step, you get something like this. And in the next step, you get something like this. But then you need to somehow set the learning rate because this is some parameter that you need to choose yourself. And the learning rate is like the most important hyperparameter of the neural network. This is something that you need to sometimes experiment with in order to set it to some reasonable number. So how does it work? Let's consider, yeah, actually, uh, yeah, this is the same example that I uh, drew on the board. Let's say you have some function and you want to minimize it with respect to theta, right? And let's say this is the, where you start with, right? So you have a ball that, is, uh, uh, that shows the location of the parameter in the parameter space, right? And you want to start from here and you want to go all the way here, right? So given this rule, given this rule, let's say you choose some learning rate and you know how to compute the gradients, right? From the chain rule that we already discussed, you know how to compute these gradients, right? So you know this, and this is something that you choose. This is some a small number. We're gonna talk about how to set this number. So you start from here, and then after one update, the ball rolls down the hill, comes here. And then after another update, it comes here. And after each iteration, it uh, gets closer and closer to the minima of the function, right? So you can think of it as, uh, as a ball rolling down a hill and choosing the path of optimal descent, choosing the path of uh, maximum descent. Right? This is how the gradient uh, descent works. So you start from here, you move along this uh, gradient of the function with respect to the parameter, you come here, you take another step towards the direction of the gradient, and then you come here, and then you move, and you move, and you move until you reach the minimum of the function. Right? It's a very simple, intuitive algorithm. So the question is, so in this, in this uh, formula, I have some learning rates. So how do I choose the learning rates? So like in the first lecture that we had the number of nearest neighbors in the K nearest neighbor classifier, this is also a hyperparameter of the model. And uh, the, the performance of the model highly depends on how you choose these learning rates. And I think we're not going to have enough time to go through it uh, properly. So I'm going to leave it to the afternoon session. And then once we're done with this, we're going to go walk through uh, two Jupyter notebooks. One of them is about uh, just a simple implementa implementation of the gradient descent in Python. And then once we're done with that, uh, we, uh, we walk through a simple uh, deep neural network to classify stars and quasars with the, with the measured magnitudes. So yeah, so the, yeah, let's reconvene uh, in the afternoon. All rolling down the hill, you might end up in a weird situation where the... Where like the ball is here and then you have a large step size and in the next update, the ball is going to end up here. And in the next update, the ball is going to end up here. And it's, it's just going to be oscillate. There's going to be a, a large oscillations if you choose a high learning rate. So the best way to set the learning rate, uh, well, it's, it's not actually, yeah, it's not a,
it's not a trivial problem. Uh, so depending on the problem, you may have to uh, you may have to uh, use a different uh, strategy. But yeah, so as we discussed, like one, one way is to use cross-validation. Uh, so cross-validation is used to set the hyperparameters of the uh, machine learning model and, uh, and uh, the learning rate is a hyperparameter. So you could use hyperparameter. Another way is to uh, decay, uh, decay the li li uh, linear uh, learning rates, right? So we can start with a, uh, with, a, with a high learning rate. So you don't spend a lot of time here in this region of the parameter space. But then as you go, as you approach the minimum of the function, you can, uh, you can lower the learning rates, right? So if you start with a high learning rate here, right? The, the ball is going to move. Uh, like from here to here, you don't have to spend a lot of time in this region of the parameter space because the cost function is high. But then you can move like this, right? We can choose a whole high learning rate for the beginning. But then as you move towards the minima, you can uh, uh, choose a smaller and a smaller learning rate, right? Another option is to actually run the, uh, run the algorithm for, uh, I don't know, like a few epochs, a few iterations uh, with many learning rates parameters. So let's say you choose uh, 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 2, whatever, 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 4. And then you can run the algorithm for 100, uh, for let's say for 100 iterations or like 50 iterations. And then you can see which one gives you a better cost function. And then you can pick the one that gives you a better cost function. Yeah, is that clear? So you basically, so in this option, in this option, option uh, you choose, let's say, five different values of the learning rate. Uh, 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 1. And then you run the algorithm. And then see, and then you can see which one gives you a better cost function after 100, let's say 100 or 50 iterations. And then you can choose the one that gives you a, a, a lower cost function. And then you can start, you know, training your algorithm with that learning rate. So the, yeah, so the, the so depending on what learning rate you choose, you might end up actually with a very different uh, answer or a very different convergence behavior. So so this is actually an important uh, hyperparameter. So in practice, the way the gradient descent works is that uh, um, so we already discussed that in order to uh, minimize the cost function, you need to compute this parameter, which is the partial derivative of the cost function with respect to the parameters, right? Uh, but the thing is, you don't have to actually uh, uh, compute this cost function for the, this, uh, this derivative for the entire training example, right? So let's say you have a million uh, examples in your training set. You don't have to use all million examples in order to compute uh, this uh, partial derivative, right? You can use basically uh, what we call a batch, uh, a batch size. So let's say you have a million examples and then you say, I only want to use at each step, at each iteration, I'm just going to use 64 of them in order to minimize the cost function. And then you only use these 64 examples uh, to compute the derivative, right? Uh, so remember, so the cost function is basically the sum over the individual cost functions, right? So J is like the sum, or let's say you have uh, N examples in your training set, right? So J is N, uh, basically uh, sum over all the training, uh, the cost function of the individual training examples, right? Uh, but the idea behind batch gradient descent is that you basically pick, so let's say this is your entire training set. You only take a random subsample of your training set 
you compute the gradient uh, with this subsample and then uh, you use the uh, gradient descent parameter update uh, with this estimate of the gradient of the cost function with respect to the parameter. So then if you do this, uh, this is a much more efficient way of actually running gradient descent. But then the batch size itself also becomes your hyperparameter. So then you end up with two hyperparameters, the learning rate and the batch size. Uh, these are the parameters that you need to set. So one typical parameter that people use for the batch size is like uh, 10 to the, no, no, sorry, uh, 64 or 32 or something. Uh, like powers of two usually. Uh, but when, when you run experiments, you need to experiment a bit with the batch size to see if, uh, if it gives you a different answer. And also with the learning rate. So yeah, these are the hyperparameters. Okay. So as we said, the gradient descent, uh, yeah, is a, is a very powerful algorithm. Uh, there, there's a few problems with gradient descent. And that is, bec that is because of the following. So let's say you want to do the parameter update. The problem with the gradient descent is that you um, you're going to spend a lot of time in the, in the regions of the parameter space that don't matter much, right? Uh, that's one of the, that's one of the uh, problems with the gradient descent. The other problem with the gradient descent is that the, in its, the, in its uh, uh, vanilla format is that, let's say you have a cost function that looks like this. Let's say you have two parameters that you want to optimize. You have a parameter B and you have a parameter W, right? And then the cost function looks like this. And the cost function looks like this, right? Then, so what happens here is that the, so the cost function basically is like, a, you can think of it as a very narrow like a valley, right? In the, uh, in the normal gradient descent, you're going to end up spending a lot of time like uh, between these, uh, uh, doing a lot of steps like this in order to approach the minimum of the function, right? Because you don't take into account the fact that uh, it's more important to, if you start from here, it's more important to move along this direction than in this direction, right? Because if you if you if you start here, right, it doesn't matter if you uh, uh, update your parameter along this direction. It matters most if you update the parameter along this direction. So this is this could uh, slow down the parameter updates in the in the gradient descent. Um, so it, so there are many yeah there are many uh, improvements to the gradient the normal gradient descents. Uh, we're gonna discuss four of them. And one of them, uh, which is uh, actually used now nowadays quite often but in the literature, is called the Adam, Adam uh, optimization, and it's actually included in one of the papers for paper discussion. So if you're interested, you can pick that one. It's like the last paper in the Google spreadsheet. You can uh, uh, pick pick it up and then learn about it and share it with the rest of us. Um, so. So, so the first, uh, uh, so the first thing that uh, comes uh, that came into the minds of people who were doing, uh, who were thinking of updates to the gradient descent was momentum. So when you do momentum, uh, the parameter update in momentum is basically similar to gradient descent. So, so you you basically use the. Uh, gradient of the cost function with respect to the parameter in order to update the parameters and you have your own, your usual learning rate. But then you add extra parameters, which is the called, uh, uh, the, this term is called the velo velocity term. So in the example of a ball rolling down a hill, you can think of this velocity term as just an extra momentum to make the ball move uh, faster down the hill, downhill, right? And what 
what this gamma, what this basically velocity term is, is, is uh, accumulation of the historical values of this gradient. So basically, let's say, let's say, let's say you have a ball again, in the ball example, and you're rolling downhill, right? So this is a step zero, and then in order to go from a step zero to one, basically say theta whatever two is, uh, no, theta one is theta zero minus uh, learning rate uh, times this derivative, right? But then the momentum, the momentum basically adds another, another term to this uh, after the first step. So in the second step, you say that theta two, like, the, like before, is again theta one minus L uh, times this term, right? But then on top of that, you add another term, right? Which is the sum of the historical values of the gradient. So you say, I'm going to add up all the uh, values of the gradients in the past. Uh, and I'm going to call it like a velocity term. Basically, this velocity term is basically the sum of the gradients in the, in the previous iterations. So if you add this term to, to the gradient update, it's going to make the it's going to make the convergence faster. It's just going to give the ball an extra momentum to go down the hill faster, right? And then another important, uh, another important uh, uh, application of uh, momentum is that let's say you have the you have uh, let's consider the cost function, which is like a narrow valley again, right? So. When the when your parameter starts from a, from a, from the region of the parameter space like here, what you what you really care about is to move along this direction, not this direction, right? And then adding the momentum t uh, momentum term basically allows you to move along this direction faster, and basically to uh, do less oscillations along the region of the parameter space along the di direction of the parameter space that doesn't matter much and move faster along this direction towards the minimum. So that is the nice thing about the momentum. So now, if you add this uh, momentum parameter, you have an extra hyperparameter, and then uh, a typical value that people in the literature use for this hyperparameter is like something like 0.9 or something. And then, if you choose a high value for this uh, hyperparameter for this uh, for the coefficient of the velocity, uh, then the problem becomes uh, the following: then the gradients that are in the past, in the very past, will affect the uh, will affect the parameter update in the present, right? Because the the velocity term comes from the gradient terms in the past, right? Times t, right? So if you choose a very large value for this hyperparameter, the gradients in the past are going to uh, affect the parameter update in the present. So that's, pro that's one problem with the, with the momentum in its uh, usual format. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a very powerful uh, uh, optimization algorithm for not spending too much time oscillating between along the directions that don't matter much and like, uh, like uh, moving faster along the direction that matters most, right? Then there is this other algorithm, it's called uh, ADAGRAD, it's uh, Adaptive Gradient Update, some, I think. I think it's like that. I, I forgot actually the, what it stands for. Great. Uh, 